person. Did you guys all know that? by accident. I was in college and I was finishing up a science degree and one of my friends went off for a year and then came back with a nursing degree and said that it was a lot of fun and she was working inside the hospital in what they call an ICU. Have you guys ever seen an ICU or you know what that is? Critical care where really, really sick people go. And so the more they talked about it, the more I realized that that sounded like something I would like to do. Um, so, I, so I did. So I got a four-year degree in nursing, uh, which is a science degree, which is something that anybody in this room could get. Uh, you could also do a two-year degree in nursing, which they offer at Lewis and Clark Community College right down the road from here in Godfrey, um, and do exactly what I do down the line. So uh, in order to do my job, you have to have a minimum of five years of, of critical care or emergency nursing experience, and then a list of certifications as long as my leg um, to apply for the job. And then you go through about a year and a half of training um, before you finally are able to kind of get your wings, which I actually get my wings when I get home that day, which is a big, beautiful, shiny thing for your badge. Um, and then you're official, um, so it's pretty cool. Do you guys have any idea, do you know anybody that works on a helicopter, or have you ever been in a helicopter? Yeah, you guys do know. You guys have Arch here, right? Arch Helicopter? So Arch, they have a lot of bases in the area, and they're actually owned by a bigger company, which is also the company that we use for our aircraft all the way out in Colorado. So we actually both use the biggest um, aircraft provider in the world. Neat. So we're all kind of a family, um, and I understand that recently there was a helicopter crash here in St. Louis, over by over downtown. Uh, we actually had a crash in Colorado as well in the last year, and when that happens, we all come together as one big family and you know help each other out and, and talk about safety and, and try to go forward. So, where should we start? I made a real quick slideshow with some pictures. We can talk about it, and then you guys can ask some questions. Okay? So this is my helicopter. These are the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, where I live. So do you guys know where we are elevation? Do you know your elevation here in the Midwest? What is it? So elevation is how far above sea level. Do you, have you guys talked about that yet? Where the ocean lies and then the mountains are way up here? No? So you guys were about 250 feet above the ocean, right? 250. Do you guys have any idea how tall those mountains are in Colorado? Huh? 14,000, there you go, right. So my town is at 7,000 feet above sea level, which is about halfway between. Can everybody hear me back there? Yes. Sort of? I'll go louder, how's that? Okay, so, so my town is exactly halfway between those 14ers and where we're standing. So where I live, it's a little hard to breathe if you're from here. It takes a little while to get used to. And our helicopters have to fly at those really high altitudes and rescue patients at even higher altitudes. So go ahead and advance. My assistant. That is my helicopter. It's 396, so all of our helicopters have numbers, so we all know where we're flying. And when we talk to airports and we talk to other rescue companies and, and police departments and fire departments, they know that we're flying around in 396, so that's very important. Go ahead and click the button, please. Sometimes they leave me behind as part of my job. I have to spend a few hours up on a ridge line. <laughs> So there we are flying off with a patient to go to the hospital. You guys have any idea why I would get left on a ridge for hours at a time? Right here. Uh, uh, to see if there's anybody else. <coughs> no, how about one more? How about, oh, here. What do you think? 
So the first guesses are to see if there's any other patients, and that's actually not the reason. How about right here, red shirt? Actually, it's because I'm fat. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the helicopter is a very small, it's actually, it looks very large when you walk up to it, but it's actually a very small machine with a lot of weight. So our pilots, the guys that are pilots have to know a lot about science as well because they have to do the math and calculate how much my helicopter weighs, how much my fuel weighs that's in our gas tank, how much all of us crew members weigh, and then how much the patient weighs so we can determine whether or not we can even lift off with our helicopters. So the higher we go, the harder it is to lift off the ground because there's just a lot of scientific forces that I won't get too in depth in. But it's very important that we, we manage our weight. So sometimes when we have a patient, sometimes when we have a patient on board, we're too heavy to lift off to get them to the hospital. So the heavier crew member, which is sometimes me, has to stay up on a ridge line for a few hours or occasionally overnight while we wait for them to come back and get us. So. Sometimes I get paid to go camping <laughs> in the mountains, right? What were you going to ask? Um, so technically you have to stay, but do you have to walk down? No, so her question was, do I have to stay there or can I leave? And my answer is when you're in the Rocky Mountains, which is the most rugged environment in the United States in terms of mountains, it's the most difficult terrain, your best option, and this applies to all you guys too, when you're a little bit older and maybe you're hiking in the backcountry, your best option is to stay where you were last seen because they know where to come back and get you. So we actually have GPS devices in our helicopters, kind of like in your cars and in your smartphones, and they can make a little dot that says, here's where we left the nurse, we gotta go back and get him because otherwise his nephew would get pretty mad, right? Um, so we can go to the next one. That's my office, and again, we're up in the Rocky Mountains. So does anybody have a guess? So your car maybe holds, 20 gallons of fuel, 10 gallons of fuel, right? How much do you think this guy holds? You, you were first, yes. 50, no, it's more, it's more. How about right there, right there, you guys. Green shirt, Batman. No, it's more than 50, I'll tell you that much. Way in the back, you. 60, no, it's, it's more than 60 for sure, right here. 100, we're getting closer, we're still not there. Gentleman in the white t-shirt. Yeah. Um, 200. Ah, perfect. 200 gallons. Yeah. So that's a lot of gas, right? Yeah. And, and we burn the same gas that they do, uh, that they use in, in drag car races, NASCAR races, the really, really good stuff. It's jet fuel. Yeah, it's called Jet A. It's very, very pure gas. So it's hot burning fuel. So that little guy holds 200 gallons of jet fuel. Yeah. Right? And I think our engine is 875 horsepower, right? It's pretty big, oh, well, right? Yeah. So how long do you think 200 gallons of gas would last in one of those things? Yes, Ashley. Um, like for maybe two days. Ah, I wish. Not two days. No, way less than two days. You right here. Uh, no, way less than that. How about right here? One day. One day. That would be great too. Not even a day. No, how about right here? That's close. Actually, it's just about two and a half to three hours tops. Yeah. Why do you that's, my answer? <laughs> that's usually how it goes, right? Right. So, um, so we get two and a half to three hours of fuel on a helicopter, uh, which is not a lot. And, and where I live, we're not actually allowed to carry a full tank of gas, right? Because gas is really heavy. And we talked about the fuel and the weight and the pilot and everybody, right? So. We have a full, a full tank of gas. I could lift off in St. Louis, where we're, what, what did I say, 200 feet above sea level? Yeah. Right, I could have a full tank of gas and I could fly all the way to, I don't know, Springfield, Illinois. Well, maybe not Mexico, no, <laughs> three and a half hours, right? So I could go to Springfield, Missouri. Oh, and we fly at about 150 miles an hour. So we go really fast. And we can go in a nice straight line in Illinois because there's nothing to run into, right? We don't have to curve with the highway. Where I live, you have to take really funny sideways lines because you're going around these big, sharp, rocky things. So, so we can only carry about two hours of fuel with my helicopter, which means when we go to rescue somebody, we have to we have to make a plan ahead of time, right? So, so I'm part of the medical crew, which means I had to get a degree in science from college, right? I had to learn how to be a nurse first, right? But then I also have to be part of the, the aviation crew, which means that I have to learn about weather, 
and I have to learn about weather patterns, and I have to learn about the science of flight, and then I have to learn about search and rescue operations, and how the police and fire departments work in that area, and where all the bases are, because we all have to come together with a plan, because we know that we only have two hours of fuel when we leave the hospital. Sometimes we have to fly for almost an hour to just get to a location to look for a patient, right? So every time we get in the air, it involves a lot of different people coming together with a lot of education and a lot of calculators, honestly. Um, so all this stuff you're learning right now with math and science and nature, it's all important stuff. There's about a million different jobs you can do with it. And believe it or not, I still take tests all the time. So if you think that you're finished taking tests in a few years, you're totally wrong. Totally wrong. Got news. So this is different kinds of weather we see. This is a bunch of snow that we kick up when we land a helicopter. And this, I think, is just a really good full moon night that we fly around in. So do you guys have any idea how we would get around at night in a helicopter? Right here with the stripes. Oh yeah, so the pilot uses, a, it's called a cyclic, that's how he steers the helicopter. So I should be more specific, so at night, helicopters don't have headlights, like cars. So what would we use to get around? You guys, right here, blue shirt. We have a spotlight, but it's only good for about 200 feet. So if we're thousands of feet above, it's tough to use a spotlight, right? Right here. Like towers from different bases? We do, we use towers. So I'll give you a hint, it's something that the military uses all the time. You've probably seen it on footage. Yeah, back here. We can do that. We can use a spotlight for a circle. What about right here? Game face. You. No, so actually, I'll give, I'll give it up. We actually use uh, night vision goggles. Like, oh, you have. Oh, see, it's always that one. Yeah. Ah, oh, I got it again. I'll come to you next time. How's that? So, so we use night vision goggles, the same ones we use in the military. Um, and we fly around at night, and that lets us see all the terrain and kind of where we are in relation to the mountains. So, again, out here, there's not a lot of terrain to worry about until you're really close to the ground. But where I live, as soon as we lift off the helicopter pad, we're surrounded by sharp things called mountains, right? So we have to get trained in night vision goggles. Uh, we have to do survival training, right? So I have to go back to all of my old military training and learn how to stay alive if we sort of get marooned in the middle of the night on the side of a mountain, right? So what do you guys do if your if your parents' car breaks down on the side of the highway, like on your way to dinner? What do you guys do? Yes. It, it, you stay where you're at. Right. You call AAA or you call a tow truck, right? Something like that, and you stay where you are. Helicopters don't have AAA, right? So if, so if we break down in the middle of the mountains, we have to get our mechanic all the way to the helicopter in the middle of nowhere with whatever tools he can carry. So. These things can be pretty uh, pretty difficult at times. Thankfully, we don't we don't have that happen very often. Yeah. So we fly around in helicopters a lot. That's why most of us that are in flight nursing kind of got into it in the first place. We like helicopters. They're big and they're loud and they're powerful and they're very sporty and you can do cool barrel rolls and all that fun stuff. But we also spend a lot of time in this guy, and that's a fixed wing aircraft. That's actually called a King Air. It's the name brand. But it's, a, it's about a 12 person airplane that we have stripped down for healthcare. So there's, there's only enough seats in there for the, the pilot and the co-pilot, and the nurse and the paramedic, and then one family member and a patient. So we can do up to six people in that aircraft. And this guy, he holds something along the lines of 2,000 gallons of fuel. And he goes much faster than the helicopter, something like 350 miles an hour, and he flies much, much higher off the ground. I think we usually cruise at 23,000 feet above, above everyone. Um, and so we can go really, really far with this guy. So we can go to California, or we can go to Boston um, in this aircraft. How long does this one go? Oh, man. I've never run out of gas in this one. It'll go a long way. Um, we, we went to San Diego and back and didn't have to stop for gas. So that's, that's pretty long. So, so this one's a lot bigger inside. It gives us more room to move around. And depending on the situation with the patient, this might be a safer mode of transport because you can, when you go on airplanes and fly to you know, Mexico or wherever you might go, 
they actually pressurize that cabin so you can breathe inside an aircraft. And a helicopter is kind of like a four-wheeler. They're just there's just big plastic windows that are open, so there's no pressurizing in the air. You have a question? Sure. Yeah, so we do have a whole bunch of lights on this thing that you can see when we're coming in and taking off. We have a whole bunch of flashers so everybody knows where we are. And we have to use the same radio controls um, that the big airlines use when you fly, you know, TWA or whatever is out there these days. We have to do the same things with air traffic controller and we have the same kind of pilot set up. Yes? Do you have to use walkie-talkies to communicate? Yeah, so the question was, do I have to use walkie-talkies? Absolutely. When we're in the helicopter, um, where'd that helmet end up? You guys get to see it? In the helicopter, my helmet has a big microphone boom right here, and I actually plug into the comms box in the helicopter so I can talk to people with a little button so we can all hear one another inside. And then in our big aircraft and our fixed wing, we have a set of headphones that are very similar that are wired in. Oh, I see it. And when we actually get left to go do a search and rescue, the helicopter will drop us off and leave. And my friends and I will have a satellite phone and walkie-talkies, and we'll, we'll communicate with our pilot and with our dispatch center in, in Denver while we're on the ground so everyone knows where we are at all times so they can get back to us. Yes, Ashley. What if you have to go back there? What? <laughs> what if I have to go to the bathroom? You guys, who, show of hands, who thinks we have a bathroom on the helicopter? Pretty good, yeah, we don't have one. What, who thinks that I thought we did when I got the job? Yeah, no, we don't have one. And actually, so who thinks maybe there's enough room in here for a bathroom? Yeah, I thought so too. Again, no, no bathroom. So, actually a friend of mine a couple weeks ago had to go to the bathroom in there. Let's just say he had to get really creative. It was very embarrassing. There's not a real bathroom in either of these aircrafts. So, um, we have, a, we have a garbage can. Yeah, good one. See, exactly. MacGyver. Thankfully, Thankfully, it doesn't happen very often. We, we tend to try and plan ahead and, and take care of our needs before we fly. Which is to say that also, we, we we're encouraged at work to make sure that we're always ready for every flight. So we, we do a safety meeting, right? Because safety is important, right? You guys talking about safety these days in school, right? It's a big deal, right? Safety is important. So before each flight, we have a quick safety brief. So the pilot has to look at weather. He has to look at where the patient is located, how much fuel we have on board, How's the weather where we are? How's the weather where we're going? And then he has to come to our, us crew members and say, are you rested? Are you well fed? Are you, are you feeling okay today? Are you, in a, are you in a good place in your head to do this mission? Or are you really stressed out because you're, you're having trouble at home? Or you're really stressed out because you haven't got enough sleep? If you're, any of those things are stressing you out, let me know before we fly and we won't go. So we have a really strict policy where everyone on board has to say, I'm good, or we don't fly. Right, so part of that preparation is to try and make sure you remember to eat something, drink lots of water, and actually, I carry this everywhere I go because that's the number one way to live forever, is to drink lots of water. So you stay hydrated, you stay fed, you make sure you go to the bathroom, you stay rested, and then we can all fly, and hopefully no one has to go to the bathroom in a, in a trash can, but it does happen. <laughs> yes. I, so the question was, can I go home or do I have to stay? So, so some helicopter companies, I think here in St. Louis, those, those crew members live at the hangar for 24 hours at a time. And when they get a call, they leave the airport hangar and they go fly. So my program, Flight for Life Colorado, is actually the first one in the country like this, the first helicopter medical program in the country. Um, and they've always been hospital based. So my office is in the emergency department in my local hospital, which means that I stay for 12 hours at a time, sometimes longer, because these things don't care what time it is. Once you're in the air, they're flying. So if my shift ends and I'm in the middle of a trip all the way to California, I have to finish that trip before I can go home. But that also means that when I'm not in the air, I'm in the hospital helping out with critical care interventions in the emergency department and in the ICU. So it keeps us very sharp. So we even fly with puppies. Yes. Yeah, everybody's favorite, right? So, yes. What kind of dog is it? Well, they vary. This one looks like a golden retriever, but those are actually avalanche dogs. They're specifically trained. You know, some of the police departments have canines that can sniff bombs or drugs or various things that we don't want anything to do with, right? These guys can sniff out humans in an avalanche. 
So they're specifically trained with their dog handlers, and we will, this is a different dog over here, and I can't tell what kind he is in the photo. You can think in advance. Um, so these, yeah, so these avalanche rescue dogs, we'll fly them up to a really high point in the mountains and drop them where we know there was an avalanche slide and where someone maybe saw a skier go down or maybe they, they, they got a beacon, like one of those spot locators. They'll start triggering to let search and rescue know that someone was injured or lost out there. So we'll bring out the avalanche rescue dogs to help them because we have a really, really fast way to get to the top of those hills, right? Yes. Okay. Well, the, so the owners take really good care of the dogs. They're only on shift for a few hours at a time, but that's a good question. The dogs are very well fed, and they, they live in really warm little cabins until there's a call to go do an avalanche rescue. So their shifts are really short, just a few hours. Yeah, and then they get to go rest with their families. Yeah. Yes. How do they put the dogs Well, the dogs go wherever they want, right? So hopefully they don't go on our helicopter, because that's a mess we don't want to deal with. And this is actually one of my pilots and one of my crew members we get a lot of rainbows in Colorado. It's beautiful there. Um, so we have lots of good rainbow photos. And that's the other side view of our, our big aircraft. So this is the view inside the helicopter. So this is our pilot. That's actually me over there. And uh, these are all the really sharp rocky things that we live around in Colorado. And we have very fancy instruments to tell us what the terrain is doing underneath us um, and to give the pilot everything he needs to get us home safe. That's the inside of a helicopter. Yeah, before we put all of our stuff inside. It's way in the back, red shirt. We don't land the airplanes on top of the mountains. That's what the helicopter is for. So some places have little runways in the mountains for, for airplanes, but most of those destinations that we would go require a helicopter. So this one actually landed on the top of Mount Everest. Just for a second, just to set a world record, but it, it was a different, it was this model helicopter, but it was very, very stripped down, so it'd be very lightweight. They just wanted to see how high they could go in a helicopter, and apparently it was very dangerous, but it did make the flight. So anytime we're landing in a very rugged 14,000 foot environment, you can almost bet we're gonna be in a helicopter. Yeah. Is there someone there that does Yeah, so we use a big company that's, that's a global company that builds the helicopters and supplies them to us. We just pay them a fee every month. It's about $80,000 per helicopter, per month. Yeah, so we have huge car payments at my company, and we have six of those. What do we got? Oh, more avalanche rescue stuff. So this is a beacon, and we can, we can go over an area where we think maybe there was an avalanche victim, and we can do a cross pattern with this little beacon, and it will, it will give us sounds to let us know when we're getting close to our, to our target, and it can actually get us within about 20 yards of the beacon that's signaling. So sometimes there's a person under there that we're trying to rescue, and that can save us hours and hours and hours getting to them. And then we have our dogs that can go along and help as well. That's our jet. I always throw him in there because he's very pretty. He can go around the world. That's a very large aircraft. It's very, very fast. And we'll use that for really, really sick patients that need immediate care, like little bitty babies that are brand new born babies, or somebody that needs to go from the Virgin Islands to, you know, to Chicago or something. We'll take that aircraft and fly there. So, we do lots of training. This is actually a picture with uh, one of the ski patrols in Colorado. We work with them a lot. We keep them trained on helicopter safety so they can be part of the crew temporarily in an avalanche situation or to help us load a patient. And then this is a whole bunch of different search and rescue and fire department guys that we certify as well to be part of our helicopter crew just for short emergencies. Okay, right there. What, when I'm on the mountain, do I eat? What do I eat? Whatever's in my pockets. Yeah, which is usually not much, right? So when I'm at work, I have to put 10 pounds of gear in my flight suit. And part of that is a little cliff bar or a little bag of nuts or something, just in case I get left somewhere. So. Um, do you guys have any idea why we wear these funny suits when we fly? Is it because they're super cool? Yeah. yeah. They might. They might protect me in a crash, but do you know specifically how they might protect me in a crash? Right here. They're warm. Well, they... Oh, yeah, and I have a question for helicopters. You know that when you have a cold, uh, uh, like right under the windshield that the driver and the uh, co-pilot put their feet in? Yeah, the paddle. What are them for? The paddles keep the plane balanced. So they're actually, they, they affect the way the plane leans. So they, they use those foot pedals to keep it balanced. Good question. 
Yeah, why would I wear this funky suit? Um, maybe in case you crashed, you could, uh, if you had a walkie-talkie inside, you could locate somebody. Yeah, there's, so there's lots of pockets, so that's really helpful. I can carry lots of gear. It's actually a flame-retardant material, so everyone that flies has to wear a funny suit because they resist flames. And when helicopters or airplanes crash, I said, how much fuel is on a helicopter? Like 200 <laughs> gallons of fuel, right? And it's the stuff they use in drag cars, so it burns really, really hot. So we want to wear these long, funny suits, even in the summertime, because they'll, they may be the thing that saves my life in a crash. It keeps my skin intact. So these are just random pictures of beautiful weather in Colorado that we fly into. Do you think we could fly through that in a helicopter? No, yeah, that's a hurricane. That would be really bad. Well, it's actually just a regular summertime storm in Colorado, believe it or not. But we can't do that because we have to see where we're going to fly a helicopter. We have to use the windshield like in a car. And this is a view from inside of our airplane, our big King Air, with our pilot and our co-pilot. And that's the joystick, the cyclic that we were talking about earlier. That's how the pilot steers that thing with a hundred other machines and instruments, all kinds of gizmos that the pilot has to know how to use. So, remember when I said you still have to go to classes and take tests? I wasn't kidding. There we all are sitting in a classroom for the whole day learning about the various things we're gonna do later when something bad happens to someone else. So our motto at work is that we like to be the best part of your worst day. So we don't want anybody to get hurt in the community. We'd rather people not be sick and have car crashes and things like that. But when they do, we like to be there to make it as good as we can for them. Uh, yeah? Well, if you're like stuck on a mountain and you can't Well, if I'm stuck in the mountains and I can't get out, they can bring another aircraft to get me, or I can use my tools, right? Because everything I carry, I have to know how to use. So all this involves preparation and training. So if I'm left in the mountains, I have to count on my training, my preparation, and my equipment to get me out of there if, if no one's coming for me. So I have a compass, I have a GPS device, maybe I have a sat phone, right? So I just have to use all the resources on my person to find my way out, whether that's getting a bearing on the direction I'm headed or looking down for the safest way off the hill, right? So all this comes down to training and education and the right equipment, right? So I'll get your hands in just a second, I promise. Go ahead. So here we are landing on Helicopter Rock. There's a hiker that was lost in the woods because they weren't quite prepared for the Colorado terrain. Um, a lot of our calls sometimes, unfortunately, are little guys your age, you know? Um, Sometimes it's a car accident, sometimes it's a bike crash. If people don't wear helmets when they ride their bikes, or they go skiing, or they go rollerblading, or they go on their scooters, or anything else you can do other than maybe running. If you fall doing any of those things and you're not wearing a helmet, chances are you're gonna get hurt and I'm gonna have to come pick you up. So we like to remind people to always wear their helmets. And I ride my bike all the time, and I wear my helmet all the time, I promise, yes. If you don't like school now, you better get used to it. Because if you want a good job, you gotta get school. It's true. So. We like to encourage everybody to always wear their helmets, right? Um, we also like to encourage people to always let someone know where you're going because a lot of these people that get lost in the mountains, if no one knows where they are, it may take an extra two or three days to get to them, right? So it's harder for us to help you. And that can happen here. You're not going to get lost in the mountains for three days, but if no one knows where you're going, you might still get lost, right? And someone's still going to have to come behind you. So we like to always keep that in mind. And, and sometimes, unfortunately, Little tiny accidents can happen, and if someone's not wearing a seatbelt, right, or they're not wearing the proper safety equipment, then they have to come see me in the helicopter. And it's not fun if you're the patient in my helicopter, I promise. Yes. That is just a marker that someone sprayed on that rock. That is just a random rock in the mountains that's just the right size to put a helicopter. So we land there a lot. Go ahead. Is that it? Okay. Okay. So that is a future flight nurse, maybe, right? <laughs> the, the cool thing is, any of you guys in here could do this if you wanted to. You could do a lot of other things too, right? But you have to remember to study, right? To do well on your exams, to try and avoid peer pressure to do the bad stuff that keeps you from studying and doing well on your exams. And you know, try to remember to always be nice to your buddies and, and, and try to remember to be good kids because you know, this kid, if he decided he wanted to come work for us later, all it's gonna require is that he studies, you know, maintains good grades, goes to college, and goes for his dreams, you know, and that's really, whether you want to be a pilot, a police officer, a fireman, a nurse, I don't know, a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, a teacher, a principal, you just have to decide what you want to do and, and make it happen, right? I'm from Alton, I grew up right down there, you know, and it was easy.
And look at that anyway, right? He's got to stick with it. Where the parachutes were, and they all laughed at me. Yeah, we're not allowed to jump off the airplane. So, so unfortunately, if we're going down, we're all going down. So we try. The pilot tries his best to make it the softest landing as possible, and then we're all trained to get one another off the ship. We don't leave anybody behind, um, and we do our best to get everybody home safe every day. Yes. We have six helicopters. We have three of those orange airplanes, and then we have one jet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so someone else usually calls us, someone from 911, for example. So if there's a car crash on the highway or something, or some hikers lost in the woods, someone will call our dispatch center. They will get all the basic information, and then they will call us and send us out. Hey, Bobby. Yes. Are we done? I don't You're good. Um, how many calls do you go out on a day, or do you, some days you don't have any calls to go out? Uh, yeah, so some days we don't go on any calls. Some days we go on five or six. So usually it's about one per day average. And in busy season, it can be two or three a day. Um, for just our base, yeah. And when we're not on a call, we have to study a lot to get all of our tests. Okay. And just for time, if you leave your email address, can they email you? Yeah, for sure. So uh, and we have, just for a couple more, we got a couple more questions, yeah. I have not, but a lot of my friends have been to Alaska. Yeah, they actually have their own separate flight program in Alaska. And my friends that fly up there can, sometimes in one day, they're on a, a, a sled team with dogs going to a village to get somebody from a little igloo, and then they bring them to town and put them on an aircraft and take them to Seattle and put them on a boat. So they have a lot of adventures to share. We don't. No, <laughs> show, no. But eventually someone's gonna do it, I'm sure, yes. Oh yeah, the helicopters are not very stable creatures. You can flip the helicopter quickly. Yeah, they're pretty, they're pretty sporty. And they make people sick. Oh, the sled dog? Yeah, that too. Yes, way in the back. What if my patient passes out? Good question. Sometimes they do. So the first thing I have to do is figure out if they're still breathing. And if they're not, I have to help them do that. Right? Yeah. Yes. Oh. 
Well, so we have a survival kit that we carry in our leg, and then on the aircraft we have a backpack, like you would see backpackers would wear, a big one. And we shove every shift, we take our little bag of our personal layers and put it in the bag on top of our standard gear, which has a tent or like a, a bivy sack, which goes over your sleeping bag. So like a little tent, a sleeping bag, and an air pad. And then we have our little our kit to start fire. And then we have one of those emergency space blankets. Those things will save your life, actually, in a, in a pinch. Yes? In the jet, two pilots, two, two med crew members, one family member, and one patient, so six humans. And in an aircraft, in a helicopter, we can do two med crew members, one pilot, and one patient, and that's it, just four people. Yes? Sometimes, do you guys like to get people out of, the, out of the water, they like accidentally drive the car off the bridge? Yeah, we've, we've helped. So generally the fire departments or the, the search and rescue guys will be the primary ones pulling them out of the water, but as soon as they hit the land, we, we take over the medical care. Yeah. Yes. I've been a flight nurse for a little over a year. I've been a nurse for seven years. Before that, I was a combat medic for three years. I was a blood drawing for a phlebotomist for about six years as well. So I've been doing something along this route since I was 17 years old. But I've only been a flight nurse for a year. What's that? Why am I? Well, it's, it's a cool job. I, I didn't want to put in the 10 years to go to medical school and do a residency, but I still wanted to do critical care and take care of sick people. And so the nursing is great. It allows me to work three, four days a week, take time off. And when I'm at work, I get to do really cool stuff with really sick patients. And I get to come and talk to people and train them on things. And so flight nursing allows you to practice at a very, very high advanced level. There's a lot of procedural things we're allowed to do. And in the hospital, I get to do those things as well. So on certain days, I get to kind of act like a baby doctor. Yes. I make them breathe. I breathe for them with a machine, or I have a, a couple of other, we call them adjunct airways and ventilator devices that we can use. So we keep them breathing until we get them off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't do mouth to mouth anymore. Good question. We don't do that anymore. There's new science that shows that the most important thing you can do is chest compression. Only if you're trained to do it correctly. Chest compression going out of mouth. start to slow down, they, they sway downward. So they can go as low as about here when they're spinning. So we have to be very careful going in and out of the helicopter with the rotor disc. We have a lot of training involved so we don't accidentally get nicked by that thing. Yes. When the patient gets hungry, we have to just get them to the hospital and then they'll feed them. I don't do a lot of in-flight meals. <laughs> Usually they're really, really sick, so they're not really hungry. Yes. Yeah. If they don't want to get on the airplane, they can refuse. That's their right. Yeah, a patient can refuse at any time. Once before they're on the aircraft, we can just leave them where they are, which we typically don't. So I think that's it. I think we don't have any more time. Here's some more questions. If you guys have more questions, you can maybe write them down or get them to your teacher. They can email me, and I'm glad to answer them. We can't stay here forever doing questions. Anymore. So, did you guys learn something about being?